So on Tuesday, I sort of introduced the way that basic computers work. And um, I said that usually a computer um, is made of a control unit and a data path. Um, I very quickly said the control unit controls the data path and um, sends out all the control signals so the data path can do the calculations on the data. Um, we introduced how a data path, a generic data path, might look like. Um, there's the register file uh, which holds, uh, well, it has the registers that hold some kind of um, memory elements. We have the ALU, the arithmetic logic unit, and we have the shifter. All of these are enclosed in the function unit that actually does um, the actual work. Now, we went and we had a closer look at the um, arithmetic logic unit. We said the arithmetic logic unit takes two vectors A and B of some n bits, depending on the size of your um, machine. It takes some control inputs, um, S0, S1, and S2. It takes some carry in from the outside, does whatever is required, throws out the result plus some carry out. Now this ALU is made of both arithmetic and logic unit and we showed how to um, we started talking about the arithmetic unit there and we said there's eight different operations that we can um, come out from the arithmetic circuit we control the arithmetic circuit or we choose the operation that we want using the two select signals S0 and S1 and then by putting in um, the carry in, um, either 0 or 1, we essentially doubling the amount of operations we can do. Um, for C in equals 0, we'll get some operation. For C, equals, C in equals 1, uh, we'll get some similar but somewhat different operations. We then shown how to, um, to build uh, the arithmetic circuit. And we showed how we can sort of split into stages. And we said that every stage has um, a similar structure. So it's enough to design one stage and then pretty much stack them or cascade them together to build the n bits arithmetic circuit. Similarly, we've shown how to build the logic circuit. And we went through the same concept of building a one bit logic circuit. And we said to. Um, to come up with an n-bit circuit, we just double it up as many times as we want. And this is where we um, stopped on Tuesday. And now we're combining the whole thing together. So, to, so we, we finished off by designing the arithmetic circuit. We built the logic circuit. And now we want to um, join them together to build the ALU. In order to combine the LU, we'll stack the arithmetic um, circuit next to the logic unit and we'll have a multiplexer to choose which one we want to use using the control line S2. Now with the um, carry out of every one of those arithmetic circuits, we'll, well, and that's pretty obvious, we've seen it before, we'll connect it to the carry in of the next circuit uh, or the next stage in our LU, in our arithmetic circuit where um, the carry in to the overall LEU will be the general carry in coming in and I do have a diagram for this. <coughs> now what we see here is one stage of the LEU the um, arithmetic circuit is one stage, the logic circuit is one stage, and we're connecting the different connections um, to the inputs here. Now, some of them are pretty obvious. If you look at the connections, some of them are not that um, obvious. I mean, we do have the vectors A and B going into the A and B inputs, but all of a sudden we have something like carry in going into the S1 input and we do have S0 going into the S1 input and it's not quite clear what, uh, what's going on. Now one of the points that I want to emphasize here is that when we build those um, circuits 
we've used those signal names as inputs to those circuits. We said for the arithmetic circuit, we'll take um, one bit A, one bit B. We'll take the two controls lines, um, S0 and S1, and some carrying, and calculate the sum, or the one bit sum from one stage, and the carry out to the next stage. Similarly, Similarly, we've um, designed their um, logic circuit in the same way, where internally we took um, the signals S0 and S1, and we've done what we wanted. But we can now connect these um, ports, if you want, to any signals that we want, and there's a reason why we want to shuffle those signals around. So first of all, the signals that will come from the outside into your LU will be those uh, bits here. The CI input of every arithmetic um, circuit will be connected to the carry out of the previous stage. The S0 and S1, the two select lines, uh, will choose the arithmetic circuit there and we'll use S2 to choose whether we want an arithmetic operation or a logic operation. And this is done using the multiplexer. In both cases, we will um, calculate both, of, both circuits will be active at the same time. We will get some result from both of them, but the one that we're interested in will be selected using S2. Now, in the first stage um, of our arithmetic, or in an ALU, and this is where um, the, dashed lines, the dashed line come into play, we will connect CI into the overall carry-in coming in from um, the outside. And you have to distinguish between um, this C-in, which is the one um, signal coming to the overall LU, and the CI, which is sort of the internal signal connected to the CI plus one from uh, the previous stage. Now, for the logic circuit, we would have, you know, it made sense to connect S0 to S0 and S1 to S1, but it turns out, as we will see in few slides time, that um, since we can use this overall scene as another control signal, the mapping um, between the function select, which is the signal uh, we will talk about in few seconds, the uh, mapping is, will become more straightforward if we use scene um, to connect to the select zero, and C and S0 to S1 here and um, not connect S1 to the logic circuit whatsoever. Okay. Yes. Could you go back to the slide, please? Sorry? Yeah, that's funny. Yeah, you're saying that the C node is equal to the C I, right? That's what you're saying? That's what the C node is from the previous stage. C node is the first stage, is the C I. C I is is the I some index, right? Um, C naught is the first stage or stage zero of um, the ALU. Yeah. So we connect that first C input, the, the first carry in, into the overall um, carry in coming from the outside. Later, we'll let the carries propagate through our ALU uh, by themselves. Oh, so, so C in goes to the C I and the SO bit at the bottom, right? C in goes to, um, it will go in the first stage of the ALU to the carrying of the arithmetic circuit. It will also go to S0, the first select line of the logic circuit. And we'll see why this mapping um, helps us. Now we can summarize everything that we talked about in this one big table there. We separate, um, again, the ALU into our arithmetic operations and our logic operations. And you can see that they're different uh, by the S1 signals. Then according to S1, S0, and C in, we select for the arithmetic circuit one of the eight operations. For the um, logic circuit, we'll select one of four operations and we said S1 was not actually connected to anything. Um, so we don't care what S1 will be uh, for these operations. Now, let me go back 
And what I might do is, um, does that work? That works. Those four control lines, when we talk about the overall data path, we can summarize them as the G select um, signals. And G select coming from the outside is a four bit vector that's made of S2 down to zero, so the three um, select lines, and together with the C in. So now you can just think about all um, these essentially four control lines as one vector called G select, which is what we'll call this work. Yeah. These signals there. And we will see um, again the mapping between this and um, the signals coming from the control unit in few slides time. Going back to the big picture, so that concludes whatever's inside the ALU. I want to talk about the shifter now. So first of all, just by looking at the block diagram of the shifter, you can see that it takes an n bits input, one um, vector of n bits. Um, it, has, it has an H select or control of two bits and um, it spits out an output of n bits as well. Now what the shifter does essentially is shift one bit to the right or shift one bit to the left or not shift at all. Just let um, this vector propagate through um, onwards. Now first of all, why would we even want something that doesn't shift at all? Why do we need um, this sort of functionality? Why do we have two select lines rather than one? Well, if you look at this whole structure, that's really the only way to get B to propagate through um, to the output. There's no other way you can select something on the B bus. And the B bus is important because we can bring constants in from the outside, which is not something we can do on the A bus, and then let it uh, propagate through. That's why um, sort of a byproduct of this shifter will be just letting uh, B transfer through. The other two options of the select lines will be either um, when it's zero run, a right shift, so take um, the N bits, shift them to the right, uh, or um, do a left shift. Now implementing a shifter is actually um, quite easy. You just um, take n number of multiplexers um, and stack them, cascade them side by side. They're all controlled by the same, um, let me get my pen back, by the same select signal, whatever is coming um, from the outside here. And you can pretty much follow the lines to see um, how the shifting work. If Hmm. This is the no. This is the S um, signal. When S is zero, um, everything with zero will be selected, which will then be B three, B two, B one, B zero, meaning we haven't done any shifting. When one is selected, well, do me a favor, be quiet. Thanks. Jeez. When one is selected, we do get some external signal, IR, coming in, and we'll talk about what this IR could be. The others just select whatever was um, from their left. So B3 will propagate through here. B2 will propagate down here. B1 will propagate through here. And this is essentially shifting the bits one bit to the left, uh, sorry, to the right, and then padding it with some external input IR. Similarly, if we chose um, S equals two, everything will be shifted to the left. Um, we'll have B2, can you see this? Yeah. B1, B0, 
and we'll get some external signal IL. Now, this is a fairly simple um, implementation. Now, I want to talk about those IR and IL external signals. If you look at the data path here, the big picture here, those two, well, underneath the cape, those two signals are connected to constant zeros in this case. So what will happen is that every time you shift um, either to the left or to the right, you will pad the new um, bit placement with a zero bit. So no dramas there. But you could do fancier things than that. Think about what shifting really means in an arithmetic um, sense. If you have an n bits vector and you shift it one bit to the left, that's your left, you shift it one bit to the left, you're essentially multiplying the number by a factor of two. It's like if you take a decimal number and you add a zero at the end um, or to the right, you essentially multiply the number by ten. Same story here. Every left shift that you do for a binary number, it's another multi multiplication um, by two. And this is some feature that's actually very useful when we optimize our um, designs. There will be a lot of uh, multiplications, and we said multiplication is um, sort of a complex operation to do in uh, digital design. We can get away with doing shifting instead of multiplications. And we will see in 2142 how we use this feature to actually come up with um, any multiplication that we want, not necessarily just powers of 2. On the same idea, shifting right by one bit is dividing by, uh, by 2. Obviously, any bits that will fall off the edge are the remainder bits, so it's an integer division by 2. Uh, but the idea is pretty much the same. Now, this is true, this multiplication and division, when you talk about unsigned numbers. And assuming um, none of your um, significant bits fall off the edge, as in if you had some number, let's say a four bit number, and you shifted it to the left one, obviously you won't multiply by two because this will now disappear. If you however had number six, you shift it to the left by one, then this zero sort of falls off the edge, and this is um, indeed a multiplication of two. So uh, for now I'm assuming we're not actually losing any significant bits, but um, problems do start when we talk about division of sign numbers. If you have a sign number which is a negative number, meaning the most significant bit is 1 to denote that it's negative, and you shift it to the right uh, by either one or more bits, if you pair it with zeros, essentially you're converting into a positive number. But we know that dividing a negative number uh, by, you know, by anything really should give you a negative number as well. So obviously the result is not correct. In order to actually um, keep the division correct for a negative number, instead of petting it with zeros, you have to keep petting it with ones. Um, and this will actually do this, um, the, the division by two or a power of two will be correct and you won't lose, um, and, and you will get the correct answer. Now if the number, even if it was signed, was a positive number, so the most significant bit is zero, then obviously you don't want to pet it with ones. You want to keep petting it with zeros. And this is what uh, we call most significant bit petting. When you want to do an arithmetic shift, that's what we call um, the shifting when we want to do division, we will pet the most significant bit or whatever bits we're adding with uh, whatever the most significant sign was. Back to this shifter here, the way to implement this will now be that every time you shift to the right, just connect your B3 uh, bit, or B N, the most significant bit, back into your um, IR, and essentially you will start duplicating your B3 every time you shift to the right. So that's one thing you can do with this um, external signals. 
The other thing you can do is make this shifter to be a rotator. So instead of shifting one bit to the left and but, uh, one bit to the right and getting rid of whatever falls off the edge, we'll connect um, the IR signal back sorry, not this one my IR signal back into my B0 my IL signal Oops. back into B3 and now whenever you do shifting you're essentially um, taking whatever fell off the edge but you bring it back from the other side so that's another thing you can do with um, the shifters. Now, um, just to conclude the talk about the, um, the shifter, this is a fairly simple um, shifter. It can only shift by one bit. Usually, we will want to shift by more than one bit. Well, not usually, but sometimes. There's a couple of ways you can go about building uh, larger shifters. You can either take this structure and then cascade it um, down a few times. So you sort of shift one stage, and then the next one, um, it just propagates down, shifts another, shifts another, as many as you wanted to. The other way to do it is to take larger multiplexers and essentially connect all the different um, options for the different shiftings, and then use the select line, which will be more than um, two bits here, to choose how much shifting and to which direction you want. Either way, you'll, get, um, you'll end up with some larger um, logic, but that's all right. All right, questions about the shifter? This is, by the way, on the other side of your handout. And this is just a sort of um, a neater version of the data path, um, of the same data path that I've shown here. This is how we can look at um, the data path as a group of black boxes. Now, the two black, main black boxes that we have are the register file which corresponds to the one up there. We have the function unit now inside the box, um, um, including everything that's in here. And now, from a um, designer point of view, we simplify the whole view we can look at this thing. So now, we don't care what's, um, how the register file works. We don't care how the function unit works. But we know what signals are coming in and coming out uh, to and from those blocks. So for the register file, all of a sudden, without knowing uh, what's going on inside, we can say, well, I've got my two um, A and B addresses, and I know that the yellow is a bit hard to see. Um, according to these addresses, whatever signals are put in, I don't care how it works, but I know that I will get my A data and B data out um, on the A and B um, output line. If I want to write data, I know that I need to assert this write signal. I need to um, write the corresponding um, destination address into the D address and then push the data to here. So um, looking at it this way and not quite the actual implementation, I can take a register file implemented by different designers or different technology and just um, <coughs> replace this register file with whatever implementation I want as long as I know the interface to it. Same story with the function unit. If I sort of ignore all the implementation side of things and I do have um, possibly different implementation to the function unit, as long as I know the interface to it, there's no problem, I can put uh, whatever function unit I want in my design um, and the two things uh, will talk with each other. <coughs> Now, when you look at um, the data path in general, whether it's um, this um, detailed one or just the block diagram, we can think about a data path 
as if it's just a state machine. Think about it. If you look at your register file, that's a whole lot of flip-flops. It's not, you know, the nice three flip-flops for the eight states you're used to. It's going to have quite a lot of flip-flops in there, giving you a lot, a lot of states. Nevertheless, it will have some finite number of states that your data path can be in. A state machine also have inputs and outputs. We do have all of our signals um, coming in, so you know the function select, the addresses, anything that comes from the control unit are inputs to this um, state machine. The state machine also have outputs, which could be the address out, the data out, um, the NZ CV flags, anything that's coming out. Um, again, it's not the one or two, you know, Z outputs from your state machine that you're used to. Nevertheless, it's, a, it's another way to look at the data path as if it's just one big state machine. Obviously, you would never go and, you know, build a truth table and corner maps and all this uh, for, for, da for data path. It's just too hard. Um, but again, that's the idea behind this. Another thing while we're on this um, topic here, we talked about how the arithmetic circuit um, can update your NZ, C, and V flags. But those flags actually come out from the whole function unit. And you can go and extend their meaning um, to actually take outputs from the shifter as well. If you think about it, whenever you have some value going through the shifter, and this is not actually in this implementation, so this is something we can do. We can look at the um, value coming out from the shifter and sort of update automatically the N and the Z flags. Because the result can either be negative, we know what it means, it means that the most significant bit is a 1. The result can either be a 0, if all of them are 0, so that will be, give some meaning to the N and the Z flags. We can define our C flag, the carry, to be whatever bit fell off the edge. In that simple um, shifter implementation, when we shifted either to the left or to the right, there was one bit that fell off the edge. Instead of letting it fall off the edge, let's push it into our C flag. And this is something um, you can do. Can anyone think of how we can make overflow meaningful in terms of shifting? Neither could I. So um, let's move on. Although now we have a flag that, you know, if, if you could find a meaning for, um, go for it. Uh, that's what I said. But the last thing I want to mention is this um, FS signal function select. Now, when you look at this view here, the hierarchical view, the function it only takes four bit function select vector. If you go into the implementation, you see inside you have something that's four bits the G select uh, for their ALU. You have two bits going into the shifter. But now all of these are actually enclosed inside the function unit that only needs four bits function select. So how do we do the mapping between the function select and um, the G and the H inputs? Well, let's see what's going on. This is another table summarizing stuff we've done um, before. You can, uh, and this summarizes the whole function unit. It's split into two where you have the shifter and the ALU and we do select um, which one we want to use using the internal MF select signal here. Now internally in the um, ALU 
we will have our sorry one two three four we will have our logic operations and our arithmetic arithmetic operations and if you remember that's how we said um, regroup those select bits so G was um, S2 down to 0 plus the C in. In the logic unit, if you remember, we didn't actually connect the S1 to anything, and it was a donker. Hence the X's here. With, um, when we talk about the shifter, we don't actually care about the G select but we only care about GH select. So that's that column here. Now we have some external signal, um, FS select coming, and we want to map those three, the MF, the G, and the H select signals to it. And this is uh, where it becomes apparent why I chose to use, almost finished, almost, two minutes. Why well, I chose to use um, the S0 and the C in rather than S1 and S0? Because, well, if you, where should we start? Um, let's start with this um, MF um, select. How do we map it to the overall function select? Well, you can either do it with corner maps or you can just observe that these will be ones only when FS, the two most significant bits of FS will be one at the same time. So this sort of implies, can you, see, you can't see that there, that our um, MF signal can be directly mapped into function select three ended with function select two. So only when those two first bits are one, this will be one, and F will, um, MF will be zero, any other case. Then we want to map our G select into something coming from the FS. And by looking at those two, they actually match quite perfectly all the way down to here. They correspond one to one. And then from here down, they still do correspond if we say, well, we don't care what the um, second significant bit is. And therefore, we can map them one to one. Here, in the case that we choose a shifter, we don't actually care what's going on in the G select. And therefore, we can say directly that the G select is just equal to the function select. And when I don't write uh, my index bits, that, that means that I'm taking all four uh, bits in the vector. The last one, the eight select, well, we don't care at all the cases up to here. And then this one, again, by looking at this, you can see that these two bits correspond to these two last bits. And therefore, I can just say that my eight select will just be the function select bits 1 down to 0. And now we can take, this is just, you know, very minimal circuitry, and we can take our external FS select going to the whole function unit and connect it to the G select, the H select, and the MF select using um, these functions there. All right, um, questions about this? <coughs> no questions. Therefore, have a good weekend, and I shall see you um, week 13. <laughs>